It's a lot of fun for me to be in this building, which I walk past uh, every day for six days to and from my way to work. Uh, it's, Brooklyn, obviously, is a very, very important part of the Federal Reserve District of, of New York. And I understand yesterday was Brooklyn Day, uh, which is a really nice uh, New York City tradition. And that sort of underscores the importance of, of Brooklyn. I think the children probably uh, enjoyed it more than anybody else. Um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, now that, now that things aren't quite as hectic as they were in 2008 and 2009, uh, I asked my staff to develop an energetic outreach program so I could visit uh, different parts of the Federal Reserve District of New York. And you know, this is important to us because it gives us a chance to deepen the relationships with the people I, I represent. Uh, as you know, the New York Fed's district uh, includes New York State, uh, 12 counties of northern New Jersey, Fairfield County, Connecticut, and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, which is sort of interesting. Uh, in May, I, I was up in the Mid-Hudson Valley to meet with community leaders, businesses, academics, bankers, elected officials, Poughkeepsie, Middletown, Fishkill, and Newburgh. And, you know, that sounds like you know, a lot, but, you know, you compare that to uh, the population of Brooklyn, two and a half million, uh, it's, it's actually pretty small compared to what we're going to do today. Now, as, as Marty intimated, Brooklyn is important to me not just because it's part of the Federal Reserve District that, that I represent, but I also have lots of personal attachments. Uh, my grandfather served as a minister on a con for a congregational church on Flatbush Avenue. Apparently, he knew Farrell Dello LaGuardia. So this is a while back. And my, my father, during that time, was actually raised as a child uh, in Brooklyn. And as an adult, I lived in Brooklyn myself for six years, just a few blocks down the street uh, in Cobble Hill. Uh, the only reason I moved, I, was, I moved a little bit under duress, don't tell my wife that, but she's an only child and uh, we needed to move, move closer to her, her parents, so we, we now live in her hometown of Cranford, New Jersey. So I'm looking, to, you know, looking for the opportunity someday maybe to move back. So what I'm here today to do is to meet with a wide range of people to talk about uh, what the Federal Reserve Bank of New York does, but also to hear firsthand from you about uh, the economic and the financial issues that are important here in Brooklyn. Uh, these conversations are important to us because they help us represent you uh, in my work at the Fed. I'm also going to have the opportunity to visit the Navy Yard, uh, and I'm going to be me meeting with the Caribbean uh, American Chamber of Commerce, uh, and also a, a number of different businesses. Uh, so what, what, what am I going to do this morning? Well, I, I want to talk to you about economic conditions in the nation and the region, and pay particular attention to uh, how the recession has affected the labor market here. Uh, looking at jobs, Brooklyn employers have actually weathered the recession better uh, than in many parts of the region uh, and country. However, having said that, the unemployment rate here remains too high, and there is still significant stress uh, on, on many homeowners here. Now, what I'm going to have to say today, as always, uh, represents my own views and opinions, and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Open Market Committee. I say that every time I give a speech. So. Let me talk, talk, by, talk a little bit about what the New York Fed is, what we do, and what makes my job so interesting. Uh, the Federal Reserve is part of the Federal Reserve System, which is the nation's central bank. It was created by Congress in 1913, so we have a centennial coming up in, in a couple of years, to manage the supply of money in the economy and, that, and, and also, by extension, the level of, of, of interest rates. The Federal Reserve is comprised of the Board of Governors in Washington. That's a federal agency that's chaired by uh, Ben Bernanke, my boss, and 12 uh, Federal Reserve banks that are spread out throughout the country. The New York Fed is one of those reserve banks. Each reserve bank is distinct in the sense that it has its own charter, its own board of directors drawn from people in the district, but we are overseen by the Board of Governors in Washington. Uh, the law that created the Federal Reserve made the central bank independent. Uh, with respect to monetary policy, so the policy makers could make decisions about what to do with interest rates in the national interest, somewhat insulated from political uh, pressure. However, th that said, the Fed is accountable to Congress. Congress set, has set the objectives for us in terms of what we're supposed to do in terms of monetary policy, to pursue the highest level of employment consistent with price stability. So this goal is often referred to as our dual mandate because it combines two parts, high employment and low and stable inflation. So also in addition to this, in order to promote these objectives, we also pay close attention to financial stability because without financial stability, it's very hard to achieve our goals with respect to jobs 
uh, and inflation. So the question is, what do the terms stable inflation and financial stability mean? By stable inflation, we mean keeping the inflation rate uh, low and fairly steady over time. You know, we, there's some, we, can, you know, we can allow some volatility month to month, but we want to keep inflation on an even keel on a year-over-year -year type basis. By financial stability, we mean ensuring that financial institutions uh, have su sufficient capital to withstand losses and are managed responsibly so we don't have to worry about the failure of one large firm triggering a cascade of failures uh, throughout the financial system, which, which would be very bad because it could trigger uh, a lot more uh, employment losses. The Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC is which we, we refer to it, uh, consists of the Board of Governors plus the 12 presidents of the Federal Reserve Banks. And we, we meet uh, eight times a year in Washington to decide what to do about monetary policy and to decide whether we should adjust uh, the, the sh short-term level of interest rates, and if so, by how much. Uh, as the New York Federal Reserve President, I'm the Vice Chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. And what happens at, the, at these meetings, each member presents uh, his, his or her outlook for the economy and makes recommendations about what they would think should be done in terms of monetary policies. Now, in making these assessments about the economy, we augment the input of our research departments uh, with critical information about local economic conditions, some from our board of directors, others from regional advisory councils, conversations with local stakeholders, and visits today uh, to Brooklyn. This is an important part of the information gathering process. So um, I'm really looking today to understand better the firsthand the economic and financial uh, conditions that are important here in Brooklyn. Now, one thing that makes my job a little bit more interesting than maybe some of the other Federal Reserve Bank presidents is that the New York Fed ha has a unique role within the Federal Reserve System. For example, the New York Fed is the one reserve bank that's actually charged with implementing monetary policy. So the Board of Governors says we want interest rates to be X or Y or Z. It's our job in New York to make it so. Uh, this means that we, at the direction of the Federal Open Market Committee, we buy and sell Treasury securities in order to adjust the level of, of short-term rates. We're also important as a part of the Fed because we're really the eyes and the ears of the Federal Reserve on Wall Street. And uh, because we're in New York, we supervise some of the largest financial institutions in the country and, in fact, in the world. We also uh, operate uh, Fedwire on behalf of the Federal Reserve System. That's uh, a, a large dollar payment system. So when banks want to wire money to each other, uh, that's done through Fedwire. We also provide a lot of services to the U.S. Treasury. All the U.S. Treasury auctions, when they raise debt, we, we are conducted by the New York Fed on behalf of the Treasury. And we offer a lot of services to central banks and governments around the world. Uh, the New York Fed basement, I think, has the, one of the largest repositories of gold uh, in the world, most of it foreign gold held on the part of other uh, foreign countries. At the regional level, uh, you know, we, we also spend a lot of effort tr tracking economic conditions in our district. And we have developed a number of tools to help us, us do that. For example, to fill a void in the measures of current economic output, uh, my staff produces monthly economic indicators uh, for New York State and New York City so we can track what's actually happening in, in these areas. We've also initiated a, a consumer credit panel so we can actually follow what's happening to households in this region in terms of their credit conditions. And we've just started a new quarterly survey to track credit and financing needs for small businesses. Uh, small businesses are obviously very, very important because they're an important job creation uh, engine. So, but before I go far, I, I want to start, start, thank a few people uh, about the survey of Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the Merle Ave Avenue Re Revitalization Program, the Fulton Business Improvement District, the Kings County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and many other members of Brooklyn's vibrant business community. They're helping us with this survey. We've had more than 80 businesses respond uh, from Brooklyn, and we're going to publish these survey results early this summer. And we, we, we will make these public. They'll be available uh, on our website. So I, I just ask you, if you're not part of this survey and you'd like to be, we'd like you to be part of the survey, uh, you, you can give me your card at the end of this talk or give the card to one of my staff and we'll, 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 we'll add you to the survey universe because the broader and more complete the survey is, the better the information that we have. So we, we, we'd like it to reflect your views as well. So to share the information that we gather and produce, we have created a, a, a rich website where we actually have a lot of localized uh, information about uh, conditions in, in, in the region, including Brooklyn. So I invite you to visit at newyorkfed.org. 
uh, to explore the, the detailed information that we have on small business, credit, and housing conditions in this, in this region. And finally, just before I talk a little bit about the economic outlook, you know, I think it's important to recognize that uh, you know, we're, we're paying close attention to the financial crisis and what to do uh, in its aftermath to make sure that this doesn't happen again. We're working with our colleagues in Washington and other agencies in the United States and around the world to help put the nation's uh, financial system on a firmer footing. As regulators, we have made progress. For example, we've crafted uh, much tougher capital rules for the biggest banks. Yet much remains to be done, and we're determined to keep at it. I recognize fully that there can be no return to pre-crisis business as usual, whether on the part of the financial sector or on the part of regulators like ourselves. We, we must learn from the economic catastrophe that, of the past few years so that we have a financial system that is able to perform its role in supporting economic activity without being a source of instability uh, for the economy as a whole. So as you see, there's lots of, to keep me and my colleagues busy, uh, even in normal times. So now let me turn and, and, and ask the question, what, are, what is the outlook and the risk for economic activity, uh, employment, and inflation uh, in the nation? And then after that, I'll talk about the region. Since the recession ended in 2009, the economy has grown, but only at a modest pace. Real GDP, that's the measure of the economy's economic output increased about 2.8% between the fourth quarter of 2009 and the fourth quarter of 2010. This growth was enough to cut the unemployment rate by about a half percentage point in 2010. However, economic growth so far this year has been disappointing. Uh, real GDP in the first quarter of 2011 grew at only a tepid 1.8% annual rate and the available da data that we've gotten so far in the second quarter indicates that growth in the current quarter will not be much better. A major factor uh, behind this slowdown is that real consumer spending growth, so what people are buying in terms of goods and services, has been slower uh, in the first quarter than it was during the last quarter of 2010. This occurred, I think, in part because higher gasoline and food prices have reduced the income that households have had to spend on other goods and services. Higher energy prices, too, I think also contributed to lower consumer confidence, which have also may have had a negative independent effect on consumer spending. As noted, a number of economic indicators suggest that the economic growth in the second quarter will also be less than what we would like. Manufacturing output for the country as a whole fell in April, and most business survey indicators, including the New York Fed's own Empire State Manufacturing Survey, also have declined recently. Although they've still remained at levels that signal that we are continuing to grow. Also, the housing market remains very weak and home prices have declined a bit further during the first part of 2011. And after a notable improvement earlier in the year, the labor market recently has been softer. Uh, more workers filed for unemployment insurance claims in the past few weeks, and firms added fewer jobs in May uh, compared to the previous months of 2011. The unemployment rate also inched up a bit in April uh, and May. So this softness does have us uh, you know, on full, full attention. Uh, this softness that we think is, is related mostly uh, to factors that will prove transitory. Uh, these factors include the rapid rise in gas and food prices that I noted earlier. Uh, they also reflect supply disruptions associated with the catastrophe in Japan, the earthquake and tsunami and the severe weather and flooding that we're having in the middle of the, of the country. Uh, so the fact that these, these factors are transitory suggests that this soft patch uh, may not uh, persist. However, we're going to continue to monitor the data for signs of more persistent weakness, uh, especially focusing on the interaction of housing and consumption uh, to, to see whether that is, is going to be a continuing uh, problem area for the economy. Another reason, though, I think to expect that the economy will recover from this soft patch, besides the fact that it looks like a lot of transitory factors are behind it, is that actually there, there are a number of fundamentals that have improved since last year. In, in particular, financial conditions have improved a bit, uh, although gradually, which makes it easier for larger, well-established firms to borrow and invest. Uh, however, I have to say that for new startups and smaller businesses, they continue to find credit access uh, difficult. The stock market is higher than a year ago, and household debt is lower. Uh, household balance sheets are not in great shape, but they're in better shape, and that should also provide some support to household spending. Demand abroad, particularly in Asia, is very strong, and that's supporting U.S. exports. 
And more importantly, notwithstanding the May jobs report, uh, the labor market on balance appears to be more solid than it was a year ago. Private firms are, have added jobs at a faster pace over the last five months than they did over the last year. And this growth in private sector jobs has been strong enough to more than offset the drop in government worker employment. Empl the unemployment rate is also noticeably lower than it was in November, even though it ticked up a little bit in April and May. So consequently, I, I do anticipate that economic growth will pick up enough in the second half of 2011 to sustain a moderate economic recovery. That said, the pace of recovery probably will be painfully slow for many unemployed and underemployed workers. Even if the economy added 300,000 jobs per month over the next year and a half, we would still likely have considerable labor market slack at the end of 2012. So even though I expect a moderate economic recovery will be sustained, the recent disappointing data suggests that the downside risks to our economic outlook have increased. So let me just list some of them. First, as mentioned earlier, high oil and commodity prices have further strained many families that already are operating under very tight budgets. Second, the renewed decline in home prices could dampen consumer spending and housing activity more than what I anticipate. Third, the recent slowing of consumer spending growth could cause businesses to hold back on hiring and investing. And finally, the aggressive near-term government spending cuts that, or tax increases that's possible uh, could slow economic growth, at least in the short to medium term. I would emphasize, however, that a credible plan for long-term fiscal consolidation is sorely required and would have many economic benefits. So although these issues bear watching, I still believe they may re mainly remain risks uh, rather than the most likely outcomes. Now with respect to inflation, after a period in which inflation was actually a little bit lower than what the Fed would like to see, uh, overall inflation on a yearly basis has risen a little bit above uh, desired levels. The recent rise in commodity prices, in fact, is likely to push uh, headline inflation up a little bit further over the next few months. It's noteworthy, however, that the spike that we've seen in oil and food prices over the past year has not spilled over very much into the prices of other goods and services. And there's some good news is, is, is the fact that commodity prices have dipped a little bit in recent weeks. So even though we've had some upward pressure on commodity prices, a rise in overall inflation, underlying inflation trends, uh, including core inflation, which excludes food and energy, uh, remain at or somewhat below levels consistent with our mandate for price stability. Now, looking forward, uh, we have to focus on what our commodity price is likely to do uh, in the future. Are, the, are those rises going to be persistent or transitory? The good news is that futures markets do not signal that investors expect commodity prices to rise rapidly from here. And provided that these prices stop rising rapidly or indeed continue to retreat further, I would expect that, that what, what that will do mean is that the overall inflation rate after ticking up will actually come back down to a level more consistent with what we want to achieve over the longer term. While this process plays out, however, it's important that we ensure that inflation expectations don't become unanchored uh, if it's much harder to keep inflation in check if people begin to raise their own expectations about what future inflation is going to be. At this point, measures of inflation expectations overall remain very consistent with normal patterns, very, very much within the range of recent years. And in fact, uh, after drifting up earlier in the year, they've actually come down quite a bit over the last few weeks. Now, we, our economists at the near Fed have looked at inflation expectations using a, a unique survey that we, we sponsor. And we, we, have a, we have a blog now at the near Fed called the Liberty Street Economics Blog. And in a, in a post on this blog, uh, they presented the results uh, of their uh, inflation expectation survey. And they found that there was, very, there was no evidence to suggest that a wage price spiral uh, was getting underway. That said, we will continue to monitor in, in inflation expectations very closely as we go forward. So to sum up in terms of the nation as a whole, we've had a soft patch, but despite that economic conditions have improved over the past year, I expect a moderate recovery to continue. However, we still have a considerable ways to go to meet the Fed's dual mandate of full employment uh, and price stability. So let's drill down now and talk a little bit about uh, the region. As I mentioned a moment ago, the New York Fed produces economic indicators to help monitor the performance of the region. And based on these measures, the downturn in economic activity in New York City ended in November 2009, so about a year and a half ago. 
Since then, New York City's economy has been on the mend, and our numbers for April show that the recovery in New York City is continuing at a, at a, at a, at a reasonably healthy clip. So let me turn now to the employment trends in the region. I, I want to contrast what's happening in New York City and New York State during the recession recovery with the nation as a whole. It's important to sort of, you know, we know we're not doing well, but it's important to put it in the context of how we're doing compared to the nation as a whole. Now, nationally, if you look at the Great Recession, which began in December 2007, it was the deepest economic downturn in the United States since World War II. And when employment finally bottomed out in February 2010, that's seven months after the actual official end of the recession, the country had lost almost nine million jobs. That's about 6% uh, of people who were employed. And the unemployment rate had more than doubled. In addition, millions of people uh, uh, who lost their job, many, all, many others saw their hours cut back or their income cut. And the duration of unemployment for those who were jobless reached uh, uh, record highs. For many families, this is a, it was an extraordinarily difficult period because this distress was also compounded by loss of wealth caused by declining home prices. Now, since the low point of employment in February 2010, job creation has resumed, albeit at a slower pace than we would like, and the unemployment rate has fallen by about one percentage point. Now, as in other parts of the country, employment in our region declined substantially during the recession. However, employment in New York City and across much of New York State, the decline was less severe than for the country as a whole. So the city and state lost less than 4% of their jobs compared to about 6% for the country as a whole. Now, part of the reason for the fact that the decline in jobs in New York was less pronounced than for the nation as a whole was that there was a less pronounced housing boom bust cycle in this region. Home construction is less important to our region than some other places that got, that got hurt more badly. So as a consequence, the city lost fewer jobs during this recession. In fact, lost fewer jobs during this recession than it did during either of the two previous downturns. So from, from the New York City's perspective, it was actually less severe uh, than what you saw in the two prior recessions. Now, as, as for the nation as a whole, we are seeing a recovery in the labor market. It has begun uh, across the region. Over the past year, New York State has uh, added about 100,000 private sector jobs. But the re recovery within the state has been somewhat uneven. New York City is doing pretty well. They've been adding jobs for, for more than a year now at about the same pace as the nation. And New York City has re recovered about half the jobs that it lost during the economic downturn. So now we're going to continue to drill down into, into Brooklyn. Uh, so, let's, so what's happening here in Brooklyn? And I think when we talk about Brooklyn, we have to recognize this is a big city. Uh, and to talk about Brooklyn, we have to recognize that the conditions do vary considerably uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. So as you all know, Brooklyn, if, if it was a city by itself, and uh, it would rank as the fourth largest in the country. So there's plenty of uh, diversity here. The population is amazingly diverse. 36% of those currently residing in the borough were born abroad, and that doesn't even include all those who are second generation immigrants. Um, my grandfather, when he was a preacher, he was an immigrant, so, so I guess I'm a third generation immigrant. <laughs> Significant numbers of residents of the borough were born in the Caribbean islands, China, Mexico, Ukraine, and Russia, but that doesn't sum up all the diversity that we have. There's people from all over the world uh, that live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn has a very vibrant business community. Uh, almost a half a million jobs are located in the borough. About two out of every five jobs are found in healthcare and social assistance sectors. And uh, these jobs represent a wide range of providers, hospitals, outpatient centers, visiting nurses, child care employers. The Bureau is also home to a ver diverse set of uh, industries, and we're going to be visiting some of those uh, today. Apparel manufacturing, retail trade, professional services. We also have a number of important public and private colleges. So where do Brooklyn residents work? Well, many Brooklynites work in businesses within the borough, uh, but in addition to that, uh, a, a lot commute. A majority of people who live in Brooklyn who work actually commute, most of them to Manhattan. That's what I did when I lived here. Um, thus, the improving job market outside of Brooklyn is also in Brooklyn, very important to Brooklyn residents. So how did the borough fare during the recent downturn, and how is the recovery uh, proceeding? So I'm going to answer this by looking at jobs and at housing and credit conditions. With regards to jobs, the news is mixed. On the positive side, Brooklyn employers have held their own uh, during the 2008-2009 downturn and have actually bounced back quite well. From peak to trough, the number of jobs located in Brooklyn actually shrank by only about 1%, which is not nearly as steep as for New York City as a whole or for the national average. 
The recovery in jobs in Brooklyn also is proceeding at a healthy clip. By two, early 2010, employment in Brooklyn had recouped all its losses and was actually setting new highs. Encouraging the job growth was brisk through the third quarter of 2010. That's the, the latest date that we have data available for. And by then, uh, overall employment was up five percentage points in Brooklyn from the low point uh, in early 2009. So Brooklyn is actually a, a, a bright spot in terms of the uh, in recovery in jobs. The job recovery here was led by ongoing expansion in healthcare, uh, which was, was not affected much at all by the downturn, as well as sizable gains in leisure and hospitality, retail, and professional and business of services. Now, that's the good news. Now, on the negative side, unemployment for those who actually live in Brooklyn remains very high. So job creation's been good, and the level of jobs in Brooklyn's gone up, but the, for people who actually live here, the unemployment rate still remains very high. Now, that seeming disconnect between healthy jobs in Brooklyn and high unemployment is largely explained by the fact that the majority of Brooklynites commute uh, to work. Uh, the man layoffs in Manhattan were more severe and, and in other boroughs as well, and that cost many Brooklyn residents their jobs. So joblessness among residents of Brooklyn is still running at a little over 9%. Uh, that's above the citywide average and slightly above the, the national average. As in much of the region and nations, uh, jobless rates have come down a little bit, uh, but they still remain stubbornly high. Also, there's plenty of room for improvement when one focuses on the situation of Brooklyn households. Uh, in 2010, almost a fifth of all families in Brooklyn had incomes below the poverty level, and that's, almost twi that's about twice as high as the, the national average. Uh, in addition, many uh, self-employed workers in areas such as real estate uh, suffered uh, big losses to their income during the economic downturn. Now, like the nation as a whole, Brooklyn did experience a housing price boom and bust, uh, however, uh, Brooklyn is showing signs of a quicker recovery than the nation as a whole. From 2007, 2000 to 2007, uh, average prices in the Brooklyn increased about two and a half times. That compares to a doubling of prices in the country as a whole. And during the housing bust, although prices fell here steeply, the decline was about 15% on average. That is not as severe as the 25% drop that we've seen uh, on the country, for the country as a whole. Uh, since uh, the, the, the home prices have bottomed out here, we've actually seen uh, prices uh, in Brooklyn to begin to recover, even though they're continuing to fall uh, nationally. Um, so the housing market here is actually in, in, in reasonable shape, but, the, but Br Brooklyn homeowners are actually under a tremendous amount of stress. 12% uh, of Brooklyn homeowners were seriously delinquent on their mortgages, uh, and that's high compared to an 8% national average. Now, of course, uh, unlike much of the nation, most Brooklynites rent their homes rather than own them. And I think that tendency to rent rather than own may be one reason why the Brooklyn's economy, just like New York City as a whole, was not quite as hard hit by the housing downturn and the ensuing recession as the country as a whole. Yet, that said, even if you're a renter, uh, a lot of renters have experienced financial stress from job losses uh, and income losses. So more broadly, how are Brooklyn families doing in terms of restoring their finances? During the recession, all across the country, debt delinquencies soared and many families found that they needed to reduce their debts to more sustainable levels. We keep track of credit conditions in the region, including the average debt that people carry and whether they're current with their payments, using a Federal Reserve Bank of New York consumer credit panel. So we actually track this on an uh, ongoing basis. In Brooklyn, although delinquencies remain very high, uh, the good news is people are, ma are making progress. Debt levels and delinquencies continue to fall. The amount of debt carried per person with a credit report in Brooklyn is now down by 8% from its peak level in late 2008 and is lower than the average for New York State. Uh, as of the first quarter of this year, debt per person was continuing to decline gradually. Nevertheless, I think the mortgage crisis has taken a heavy toll on Brooklyn homeowners in terms of consumer debt, so this, uh, this is, uh, if you look at delinquencies, so I'm, I'm gonna include mortgages here, seriously delinquent debt quadrupled between 2005 and 2009, and it climbed to roughly double the statewide average. Uh, now, as of the first quarter of 2011, the delinquency rate is starting to come down, but delinquencies in Brooklyn remain far higher than the rate in the rest of the New York State and in the nation. So these patterns suggest that Brooklyn households have made some progress in restoring their balance sheets to health, but it also suggests that they still have a considerable ways to go before they complete this process. 
So to sum up, Brooklyn was affected by the recession, but less so than the nation as a whole, and even less so than the New York City overall. With prospects for the national economy improving and the outlook for Brooklyn's diverse economy and labor force, and New York's as a whole, I think the outlook for Brooklyn is brightening. Nevertheless, while a jobs recovery does appear to be underway, unemployment and poverty remains high, and signs of stress clearly remain in terms of household finances. In the near term, the regional economy, and indeed the economy in the entire state of New York, faces a number of challenges. Among them is the need to address the large state budget gap. Uh, New York State is not alone in seeing uh, its tax revenue decline as the economy weakened, and thus the state faces some hard choices. As I mentioned, state and local government employment has already weakened in many areas, and I think going forward, further contraction in this sector uh, continues to pose some risk to the economic recovery. Despite these issues, in our recent survey of small businesses, nearly 40% of businesses reported an increase in their sales during the first quarter of 2011. In addition, when we asked these businesses about the business outlook, over two-thirds of the Brooklyn respondents uh, responded positively, saying that the outlook for their business was fair to very good. In fact, small businesses in Brooklyn were the most optimistic among the five boroughs of New York City, so that's, a, that's, that's some awfully good news. Longer term, one of the key challenges, though, I think for this region is to ensure that it trains and attracts a highly skilled workforce that can meet the needs of innovative and rapidly changing firms. Uh, a region's human capital, that is the skills and educations of its workforce, really determines in large part its economic success and resiliency. Uh, the education and research taking place in local colleges and universities such as Brooklyn College and the Polytechnic Institute of New York, which are here in, in Brooklyn, I think are very, very important. And they help to build those skills and help sustain econ economic growth over time. So to sum up, the national economy experienced a soft patch in activity during the first quarter of 2011 that has spilled over uh, into the second quarter. Nevertheless, the recovery in much of the region continued at a, at a good pace. It's very encouraging to me that Brooklyn employers have already added back enough jobs to replace all those lost during the recession and, and then some. The continuing expansion of employment across the nation should also help support economic activity and jobs in Brooklyn. Yet the re recovery in the region and in Brooklyn is still far from incomplete. Brooklyn households continue to have relatively high delinquency rates on their mortgages and other debts, suggesting continued stress on, for many of its residents. And furthermore, despite recent improvements, both nationally in the city and in Brooklyn, unemployment remains unacceptably high. So thank you for your kind attention. I'll now be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Jim Bowen from Senator Montgomery's office. You mentioned that the uh, Fed feels that there is a greater sense of optimism among investors, uh, especially with the monetary and commodities markets. But how do you fit in the astronomical price of gold into that? What are the what are the implications of that? Well, I, I would say that you know we we certainly do you know note what's going on in terms of gold prices, and we have to look at gold prices in the context of inflation expectations more generally. Uh, there's a lot of different measures of inflation expectations. Uh, there's a consumer survey of what people expect in terms of future inflation. Uh, there are the financial market indicators, for example, uh, what's, what what uh, rates are on Treasury inflation protected securities compared to nominal Treasuries. And there's also a survey of professional forecasters. So if you look at that broad set of indicators, what that's telling you uh, is that inflation expectations, after drifting up earlier this year, getting to levels that were starting to concern us, uh, they've actually come down about, you know, they've, 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 they've reversed course and come down a bit, probably reflecting what we've seen in terms of the, the, the decline in commodity prices over the last few weeks. So, you know, the jury's still out. We're still watching inflation expectations very closely. Uh, but uh, right now, it, it, they, I would say, you know, our, our characterization of inflation expectations is that they're, they're generally stable. Daniel? Uh, Daniel Desmond, president of Hybrid Media, a Brooklyn-based business that builds brand experiences for clients looking to reach ethnic markets in New York, New Jersey, and South Florida. My question is, we're talking about uh, the recession um, and how it adversely affects uh, businesses. Now, the severity um, of that effect is different for minority and women-owned businesses and minorities in general as, as opposed to general market. And a perfect example of this, you talk about the 
the unemployment rate, which teeters between 9 and 10 percent um, here in New York City and nationwide. But for African American males here in New York City, it's more closer to 50 percent. So what is your agency's strategy and um, the federal government strategy overall to address the severity of the um, recession between minority and women-owned businesses and minorities in general and the general market? Okay. Well, well obviously, this is, a, this is a real challenge. And I, I can say that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, we've, we've put a lot of energy into diversity and inclusion. And inclusion. So what that means is that when we're hiring people, we want to make sure that we have a diverse slate of candidates. So we're interviewing the right set of people. Uh, when we uh, when we when we do uh, uh, purchases, we want to make sure that uh, the vendors that we use uh, include minority-owned businesses and women-owned uh, uh, businesses. Uh, we also do a lot of outreach uh, into the community in terms of working with community development uh, organizations. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of, you know, this is very, very important to us. I mean, to basically, for us to be successful, we have to have a diverse uh, uh, and inclusive workforce. But also, to have a successful economy, we need to have everybody uh, ha have, a, have opportunities. And so we're doing a whole, a whole host of things through a number of different avenues uh, to, try, to, to try to do our part. Uh, but, you know, it, it is, you know, I think you, hit, you know, you, I think you made a very good point that the unemployment rate among African Americans is, is much higher than the nation as a whole, and this is something that we're just going to continue to have to work at. Colvin? Colvin? Yes. President Dudley, good morning. Colvin Granham from Business Labs and Restoration. Um, earlier this week, I believe, the President spoke about the importance of training in terms of addressing the unemployment rate. I wanted to know whether you agree with the substance of his comments in terms of the importance of training and whether you have any specific, specific advice you can give to organizations like mine in terms of how to direct people with respect to specific types of training. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I'm an expert on that, that particular topic, but I would certainly say that, yeah, absolutely we agree that job training is, is, is absolutely essential. You know, the, you know, people's standard of living over time is determined by the skills that they have and the skills they have are clearly strongly affected by the training opportunities they have. Um, we've been talking to people traveling around the whole region and uh, talking to people from upstate New York, we actually uh, heard that uh, one, one, there was a problem there that uh, uh, even though the unemployment rate was pretty high, people were actually f having trouble finding people with the skills they need. So that just, that just underscores the need for appropriate training. Uh, to get people the skills they need so that the skills they have matches the skills demanded by businesses. So completely agree with, with, with the point. Uh, and, and you know, this is something that uh, you know, I think we have to continue to work for. And it's particularly important now when you have people that are, have been unemployed for long periods of time because when people get, are unemployed for long periods of time, they tend, their skills actually tend to erode and it becomes more difficult to, for them to re-enter the workforce. So that particular set, subset of people are the ones that I think we really have to focus on. So we can get, you know, the sooner we can get them plugged back into the labor market, get them jobs, uh, that's going to be good for them, but it's also going to be good for the country as a whole. Lisa? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what, small business lending is still impaired. Businesses are not getting the funds very easily from the banks. Now, it's, it's interesting. You talk to the, to the bankers, and they, they, they claim that the, the money is freely available. But I think, I, think you, I think you did hit an important point. I mean, what's basically happened during the recession, if you look at especially startup businesses, money t typically for startup businesses comes from three sources, prim pr predominantly family, credit cards, and home equity loans. And the reason why you know, credit to small businesses is impaired is that credit cards, terms and conditions have been tightened, and home equity loans have obviously been really hit by the downturn in housing prices. So that's really constrained uh, the, the access of small businesses to, to capital. 
you know, you know, the way we work at it is we, pro we, we want to make sure that our examiners, in terms of when they go in to examine the banks, that the needle doesn't swing too far. Now, obviously, during the boom years, uh, probably uh, the banks were probably too liberal in certain aspects of who they were willing to lend with, especially the terms on which they were willing to lend. But it's very important that now, when times are not so good, that the, that the needle doesn't swing too far uh, in the other direction. So, you know, we basically want to make sure that our examiners uh, understand that you know, good, prudent loans they they should be made, um, and uh, you know that's what that's the encouragement that we give them to do. Uh, you know, one of the problems, of course, always is is when you're coming out of a recession, is the businesses that you think are good credits that you're willing to lend to don't need the money, and the ones that are actually having trouble. Uh, their credit condition is more impaired, and so the banks are more reluctant to lend to them. So, you know, I think things are gradually getting better, but I think your, your point's well taken. This is an area, this is probably one of the biggest trouble spots uh, for the economy, uh, getting a flow of credit restarted to small businesses. That, that's it, right? Okay. I, thank you so much, President Dudley. For Thank you.